this is Grandmaster's Choice. This time, I'm going to show you my most complex games versus Daniel Dubo. You might be wondering, who is Daniel Dubo? Now, if you haven't been following the new chess meta, there have been new, young, and upcoming grandmasters who like playing their brand of chess. Their brand of chess that is a bit more refreshing, a little bit more speculative, a little bit more intuitive. So for that, I'm going to show you a couple of those games that I played against him in recent times online. So I'm going to start with this game and you'll see that his style is more of explained as a chess maverick and he's not afraid to be one. So let's get started. So in this game, I played one e4, e5, and you might be wondering what is the big deal? Your opponent just played e5. Well, Dubov plays literally everything. He plays c5, he plays e6, plays c6, he plays e5, of course. All of the moves are possible, and it really depends on his mood. So e5, knight c3, sort of an invitation for the Vienna, knight e2, and sort of I'm bouncing the ball back into his court. Knight g e2 is not a very usual move. So I'm sort of giving an own taste, my favorite taste, to the position. Sort of, we're trying each other. Knight c6, g3, bishop c5, bishop g2. But after a little bit of move ordering, we actually arrive at a classical Vienna position with white losing the fight for the d4 square, but winning the battle of the d5. d6, d3, a5. And a5 is, again, a different type of move. Anytime you check the database what moves have been played, it's usually either h6, taking away the bishop g5 square, stopping that pinning idea, or a6. Now there is a flaw to h6, which a5 and a6 solves, and that is there is no knight a4 anymore because the bishop can hide on a7. But again, this is what I'm going to talk about while we look at these games that I played against Daniel Dubov. He likes to go into openings and ideas that are not well trodden and are very original. This a5 move sort of shows he is ready for a fight, like always. h3. And he even goes further, plays not just a5, but a4, and moves it down the board, even threatening to play a3. Now, if anything, I felt if I let a3 happen, my knight will get a little bit unstable with a charger pawn having to move to b2, b3. So I'm going a3 myself. I don't want that to happen. Knight d4 not only putting a knight in the center, but also making sure I don't have d4 breaks. Knight takes d4. I just want to eliminate that strong knight. Bishop takes d4. Knight e2. I'm trying to get rid of that bishop. Bishop b6. So this is a moment for us to think for a minute. So what would be an interesting way for white to continue? Don't forget, most of Dubov's pieces are lurking around my king side. So castling might prove to be somewhat risky. It is probably playable, but at the moment, risky way of play. So if we're not castling, what type of other moves could we consider here? Was this game played on Lee Chess? 
obviously can go bishop e3 but bishop e3 would be somewhat tepid and if you're playing against Daniel Dubov at least you want to spice it up so I'll play g4 I did not want to go bishop e3 I want to start expanding on the king side bishop e3 probably is even but g4 is way more ambitious now my opponent that is Daniel Dubov realized oh so you play it that way you do leave a couple of squares weakened and embarks on a quite interesting maneuver in fact a very strong one knight d7 it's not just a move it's a plan it's a plan either go through c5 e6 and to f4 and d4 or go knight f8 knight g6 knight h4 and knight f4 and that, that's actually kind of the fun part of this game called chess if it's not a well-trodden path if it's not an overanalyzed Berlin position there is still a lot of play left and these original ideas and maneuvers can be accomplished knight d7 knight g3 knight c5 now if I'm just waiting around Dubov is going to plant a knight on f4 and I'm not going to have a fabulous time so I played knight f5 myself knight e6 and now I played bishop e3 if trades of course I will take with the f pawn I can't tolerate that knight show up over there so bishop e3 g6 knight g3 queen h4 and you can tell that actually Dubov's plan was a success that knight did arrive in a great position and it is heading towards d4 or f4 regarding and it's still kind of pending or wherever he wants to put that knight so now again we've got a decision to make which side should we castle on We can tell short castling does not seem too appealing and eventually h5 might just wreck our position so of course i went queen d2 bishop takes queen takes c3 i've got to otherwise the knight is hanging c5 now there are problems with playing close positions if it's already quite bad but luckily this situation is by no means too bad for white in fact if we can come up with a good maneuver and find a good target for white i might be able to turn this position around so our goal will be to find a good outpost for white's pieces and actually I did the question is where is that outpost yep the outpost is over here on d5 so i embarked on the mission of getting there if i get that spot i will be standing quite well also knight e2 is multifunctional i take away that knight f4 jump and i take away the knight d4 jump in both cases i'd be ready to swap off my knight and black wouldn't be making any progress in that case b5 
and I guess somewhat to his shock I castled long, because I don't really fear b4, even if we trade, I can just move my king back, just walk back to d2 e1, and my king is not in direct danger. Queen f6. Clearly threatening to go knight f4. Question is, how do we react to this idea of queen f6? Well, we ignore it. So I just go and went knight c3. And if knight f4, I went knight d5. Your threats are not real to me. You can't take there. I take your queen with a check. Takes, takes, and suddenly the position starts shifting. I already castled. His king is still in the center and I've got way more control in the middle than he does. So he realized that and goes for h6. So he's embarking on the mission of closing everything down. So our job in this position will be to undermine Dubov's position before he could consolidate. So it is white to move and undermine Black's position. So black clearly wants to play g5 because is somewhat afraid of an f4 idea. If f4, according to my humble math skills, we're going to lose a pawn in that case. Definitely a wild thought, but maybe too brave. So when rook e1, because I kind of suspected that Dubov is going to play g5 anyways, stopping this f4 break, because now f4 would be on the cards due to this spin. You cannot really castle because f threats on queen h6. And after g5, now as I see this weakening move, now I go d4. And this is an offer he cannot refuse I am going to be trading the pawn. So takes, rook takes d4. And interestingly enough, from a position that was more like an e4, e5 system, turns into a complete Sicilian stronghold position. Castles. Okay, so again, Dubov survived this part of the attack. So again, we've got to do a restructuring. Question, which side should we play on and which targets can we latch on from this position? And in this case, there never really was a moment they could trade. We had pressure on the e-file. b5 is weak. I noticed that too, so I'll play rook b4. And not only do I guard the f4 square, but I'm also setting up an idea of undermining the b-pawn. And if the b-pawn falls, so is the a-pawn. Bishop d7, bishop f1, rook b8, and now my f1 bishop is meeting the c2 charger pawn, it's all well charged, 
it's very, very difficult for Dubov to do damage to this position because my king is just very well guarded there. Rook c8, but then my Sicilian instincts kicked in and I played king b1, just making sure it does not run into danger. I was thinking about the idea of setting up the battery, Metallica style, but it does just feel like one single check. I can just move away with king f8. Rook c5. Rook c5. Rook c5. Rook d1. King f8. So, I was very confident with my position. I think that white is better. I still think white is much better here. But being better does not mean you're going to win. So we've got to come up with a long-term plan. So if we look at this position from a strategical standpoint, which one of black's pieces are the best or the most well-coordinated? Well, one of them is the rook on c5. It defends and it attacks. But there is one other piece that is sort of a nuisance, and that's the queen on f6. Not only does it guard those squares, but it also attacks my f2 pawn and is winking on my king side. I'm fairly confident that um, my king is safe, but you never know that queen is lurking under the shadows and anything can happen. So I played bishop e4. King e7, and I played queen e2. And I think now you suspect what I'm attempting to do here. Because now it is blindingly obvious. Was this game for this year? No. We're doing the rook lift. The rook is showing up just to show the way out for that lady. It's just being too much here. We don't want to hang around much longer. Rook c4. He is willing to sacrifice a pawn, so I would not embark on this mission. But you can't stop me now. My rook is having a good time. You can't stop it at all. So takes <laughs> rook c8, rook f3, and my rook is actually unstoppable here. Queen h8, and actually I'm trying to go both ways. I'm swinging at this one, and I'm swinging at the other one, going bishop d3, and I'm going after the b pawn. So I'm saying, hey, Daniel, go back defend the b pawn now. Rook v8. Okay, so, so far so good. We've got a target on b5, we've got a target on f7, but we've got one more piece that is not as heavily involved as it should be. The queen. How can we involve that queen a bit more in this position? Queen e3. We're lurking in there, yep, that is correct, queen e3, and we are lurking in there. Now, here Dubov 
plays f6, but as we know, f6 is a big no-no in Ben's book. And if you're in Ben's book, you're in trouble. f6, the queen is cut out of action, and my pieces are just dominating. c3, over defending my pawns. Rook c8, ah, 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 ah. You're going back. You're going back defending that. Rook g3. And now Dubov had enough. He knew I'm going to go h4 sooner or later, so he's taking some desperate actions. And if they offer you a pawn, you may as well not refuse it. Queen h6. Bishop g6. f5. So now Dubov is trying to complicate matters and win time on my rook. So I decided just to move it away. King f6. And now you can tell with the king and queen moving forward, it is getting more and more dire for Daniil. So should we let our opponent go f4, or should we circumvent that with an aggressive move? That is the big question here. Now of course, uh, 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 we're not going to let f4 happen there. We're going to go queen e3 first. We go queen e3 first eyeing that queen and that king and yet again our villain of the day the queen is arriving on a7 bishop e8 h4 undermining the g pawn f4 and here i came up with the decisive sequence so I'll give you a chance to find it. This is a very, very nice sequence, and I hope you will find it as well. So currently, I can't really take on g5. There's queen takes g5, and my queen is hanging as well. So if takes, then pawn takes, and it's not abundantly clear what's going to happen there. So instead, here I have to reverse the move orders. The question how I did that. And also notice, if I move my queen, there is also this idea of taking on g6 with check. And that is also on the cards. Wherever our queen moves, we've got to tend with bishop g6, and that's a big question if we have an idea against that. So let's say we move the queen there. What happens if they capture the bishop? If you go queen e4, I take on g6. And if you take, then this queen takes g5, and it's not going to be a lot of fun. So don't forget, we are setting up this idea of taking on g5 and threatening that. So we've got a huge threat looming already. Big, big threat looming. Queen a7. Bishop takes g6. And thank goodness, chess ain't no checkers. You don't have to take back on g6. I played king a1. And I'm down a piece. But black is basically out of moves. I'm threatening to take the rook, 
threatening to take the bishop and I'm threatening to double attack the king and queen. And after this very quiet move of king a1, Dubov has no way out. Queen f8, h takes g5, and the king has to walk up in the center. Not a good sign. Queen d7 check, king e4, h takes g6. Now I don't really want to emphasize king safety here, but my hunch tells me that the king on a1 is slightly more safe than its counterpart on e4. And don't even get me started, this is not yet an endgame. We still have the queen's rooks on the board and a real fight brewing in the center. a3. And I could try to react on the queen side, but I felt it's much, much better to push my g pawn and create the additional threat of promoting. Queen c8. Queen takes d6. He takes b2. King takes b2. I mean, just picture this position. The king is basically without any shelter. The only pawns he has around are just about to fall to rook e1 check. Rook a8 check, king d3, queen takes e5, king d2, and queen e2, checkmate. Well, that king did go a long journey just to end up checkmated on the d2 square. Now, Dubov started off with a very promising position, but once I managed to exchange off his strong e6 knight, turn it around, put pressure on his weakened pawn structures, I could just get a very, very good grip on the position and then go on with this beautiful sequence of queen a7 and king a1, which was the key move there. Yep, that was quite a hike for that king on d2. Now, this wasn't obviously a one-sided match with Daniil Dubov, so I want to show you another game that we played, and this one is quite pretty. You'll, you'll see, and it's quite a masterful performance by Dubov. Okay, so let's take a look. So d4. D5, knight f3, and there is an interesting story, backstory for this one. So, Daniel Dubov played this variation, c4, e5, which is called the Alban, d takes e5, and knight e7. But if you check the databases carefully enough, you'll find a grandmaster with the name of Denis Borosh playing this around a handful and a dozens of times. I played this line myself. And you know, just like anyone else, I was looking through the Magnus Tour games, and guess what I see? I see Sam Shankland facing this knight e7 line, the very line I was popularizing, played by Daniel Dubov. So in comes this game. Daniel plays d4, d5, and he goes knight f3. He goes knight f3, and he is not interested if I want to play the Albin variation of the knight e7 one. So interestingly enough, whenever we got into this position, this is what happened. Knight f6, c4, e6, g3. Bishop b4 check. Now, here everybody plays bishop to d2 and gets into a long theoretical line, but Daniel Dubov doesn't like to go on the well-trodden path, as we said before. He likes to go his own way, 
get something much more original. I castled, bishop g2, a5, castle, b6, knight e5, bishop b7, queen c2, knight d7. c takes d5, take, 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 knight f3. So here, actually, Dubov already shows his intentions. He is going aggressive. He is willing to double his pawns, but this pawn will also be of an asset because it takes away this defensive square from my knight. So his next threat is to go knight g5 and go directly attack my king. So played h6 just to stop that. a3, bishop c5, rook d1, queen c8, just sidestepping this x-ray, bishop d2, a4. Knight e1, and knight e1 is a very, very nice move by Daniel Dubov. He is activating that knight and tries to smoke out my bishop. And here I played bishop d4, which in hindsight is somewhat inaccurate. I really should have tried to trade off these bishops. And um, the position is more or less even in this case. Bishop d4. But bishop d4 actually allows a very nice little tactical sequence for Daniel. So let's try to find it. Chat and viewers, let's try to find the move for Dubov. Same. So notice that this bishop on d4 is loose. It's not defended, and it's vulnerable for tactical ideas. And in fact, white is able to go e4 here put pressure on the d5 knight, the knight moves, and then takes on h6. With the marked difference, if bishop f2, the queen can capture. And the queen will intrude in black's position. Now, of course, I would rather take on e5, but here white has this very surprising idea of knight f3 going back and forth like a yo-yo, attacking that bishop. If takes here, this is, of course, strategically lost. And white, obviously, is better here. Now, he didn't play that. He played knight d3 instead, giving the chance to go bishop a6, which was a good move by me, because I have pressure on the knight, and bishop takes e5 is coming very soon. Queen takes a4, accepting that fact. Bishop takes d3, takes. Bishop takes e2, rook e1. c5, queen h4, bishop d3. And round, round around here, I felt very content with my position. I have sort of a pseudo Karl Khan situation. I'm a move away from chasing away Dubov's queen, and I don't really think that there's anything happening here. However, after Dubov's next move, there is a rude awakening happening. Very rude awakening. <clears throat> Bam! Bishop takes h6. The bishop arrives on h6, and I couldn't believe my eyes. Dubov is giving up a whole piece with my bishop guarding this ever so important diagonal. Takes, queen takes h6. So I first had to realize what Dubov's plan is. Dubov's plan is clearly 
to go bishop e4, trade, get to g4, and it's checkmate. So let's just say b5 here, takes, takes, and rook g4 is deadly, because if you move the pawn, check here, rook h4 mate. So actually, um, attacking here is much more intuitive than defending. But if you realize that one of the key concepts is to do this check, so get this queen g6 check there, it's much easier to find this move of rook a7. I did not find that one. Because, say, bishop e4 takes, takes f5, black would be just in time to go rook g7. So, rook a7 would have been an option here. Rook d1, bishop h7, bishop e4, f6. And of course, this whole variation continues on, but black is definitely in play and probably is somewhat better too. But rook e7 is not an easy move to find because it is sort of four or five moves deep realizing that rook g7 is the way to block off all those checks. Also, rook a7 does not have too much connection with this bishop, and this bishop on d3 still seems very loose. So I came up with the idea of rook a4, which is also pretty good. I'm trying to take away and control the fourth rank and stopping any sort of bishop e4 or even rook e4 ideas. But Daniel's next move is, again, quite good. In fact, quite amazing. What did Dubov play in this position? b4, indeed. Just giving up a pawn, all what he cares about is the initiative. And this is sort of the new, more exciting way of playing this game of chess. You are willing to take the risks, but if your opponent just misses just one beat, you're going to become a winner. So b4 is a very, very nice move, and now suddenly bishop e4 is back on the map. So I played bishop g6. So if bishop e4, I can go knight e7. And bishop g6 was a good move. h4, c takes b4. And this is the moment where he's sort of going overboard a little bit in this position, white still has enough play. After bishop e4, black is still doing very well, but white has play. White definitely has good play after takes, takes, h5. And with my king very much exposed, the pawn coming to e6, White is going to have enough play. More than that, that is still up in the air. It's a very exciting position. But instead he goes h5, and h5 is not the most accurate way of playing. Bishop f5, g4. But talking about accurate, I've been defending well so far. And now we've got to decide what to do. Should we go for counterplay, or should we stick to our extra material advantage? And that's the question I had to answer here as black. And of course, I can't really take that. Then there would be queen g5s, and they take my bishop. And I didn't want any part of that, that one. So the truth is, 
The move I played, b3 was a good move, but bishop c2 would have been safer, and after rook e4, trades, trades, the logical conclusion would be queen g6. And there's perpetual check. So I went for b3, which is a bit more adventurous. Still good, but it turns out to be a little bit too adventurous from my part. And the next move is crucial. And here I make a slip, which will cost me dearly. I go rook g4 here, which was a little bit too early. The idea was correct. This is the way to defend against any future checks and get counterplay on the king on g1. However, on the other hand, b2 would have been the most accurate move. Rook d1 and now rook g4. Now rook g4 is the move. And the only thing I really missed is the fact that after rook e4, black has this very unique defensive idea of rook g7, f6, rook h7, and the king can hide on h8. And I don't know if you can call this logical. I wouldn't dare this, call this a logical defense. The rook actually crabs its way back to the king side from a8 from g4 to g7 to h7 that would have been quite a journey now the best move here is f6 knight f4 and white holds the equilibrium with this move of king h1 and draw occurs after rook h4 check here and rook g4 not at all uh, unfindable moves, but that b2 move would have been crucial. And b2 would have been crucial because it oftentimes threatens to promote the queen in some specific lines. But I played rook g4, and rook g4 runs into rook e4 now. And with this pawn just too far away, it can't go here, because rook takes g4, I am just losing. He takes f5, takes, takes, bishop d5, and now obviously it is game over. b2, we played a couple more moves, but queen g6 is again a very nice technical solution. He is double attacking, and my king is pinned, so I can take with the f-pawn. Here, 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 and rook takes b2. So quite a beautiful win by Daniel Dubov. So I wanted to show that he did play a magnificent game. But that is not all. I've got a third game for all of you probably my favorite. So let's take a look at this one. Again, in this one I was white. However, in this case, I actually played d4 instead of e4. Knight f6, knight f3, e6, c4, c5, e3, a6. And funnily enough, again, Dubov doesn't feel like changing it up. d5, and here I was wondering what I should do in this situation, and I realized, well, Dubov is going to take on c4. So I'm going to go knight d2, take here, and centralize my knight. So takes, b5, knight e5. Bishop b7, but here Dubov missed one critical thing. 
critical, critical idea. Which is seldom happening ever in these games. It's a very, very rare plan. I have knight g5. And suddenly, there's no way you can stop knight takes f7. c4, obviously I take. You can take my bishop, because I take your queen. Bishop b4, bishop d2, queen a5. Now, in this position, I'm already winning, but when you're winning, try to go for clarity. And so I did. I went for knight d6 check. Knight takes, 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 c takes, f3. Realized that Duba wants to go knight e4. I said, no, 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 no. Don't want any part of that. Check. King takes d3. Again, there's no rook c8 because of knight d6 check. Knight d5, rook c1, a4. Trying to probe for more weaknesses. Rook c8, king e2. No rook takes c6 trickerinos. Knight b6, a5, b3. So if you take, I take on c4, and I'm going to cover up everything with knight c5. So that's not an advantage from our opponent. So took. Knight d6, rook c7. And here I realize something. My opponent's pieces are tangled up. So it's white to move and take advantage of that. And it's, it's probably the most unique position I ever got in my chess career. So the first move is knight e4 check. If you move the king anywhere to g6 or f7, I can check here, take on c7, and I win the knight on e3. So black has to oblige and go king f5. Has to go king f5. There is basically no other choice. However, this is the beginning of the end. It's white to move and win. G4 check. You can't really take that because I check you and take the knight. So you've got to go deeper in the woods. Knight e5. And black's king is mated on the middle of the board. If you go rook takes c1, well, I ain't going to take your rook. It's knight d3, checkmate. It's game over. And your king, again, wandered straight into the forest of pawns and knights. It's just being captured in the middle of the board. Quite, quite a scene. So my opponent decided to take on g4 as a desperado. I can check, and I did. Checked again. King here. I took on c7. Takes rook g1. Now I'm pinning the piece. F takes. Check. Check. And because king e7 runs into knight g6 check, in this position, Daniel Dubov resigned. So I really hope you enjoyed these fascinating games that I played against Daniel Dubov. 
hopefully there'll be more to come. I enjoyed it very much. And some of these games felt a little bit unusual, even for me. Thank you so much for watching, and good night.